welcome back to this channel so in this video we are going to learn about programming so and this is part of your IGCSE computer science syllabus in chapter 8 and the programming language that we'll be using is called the Python programming language which is widely used in machine learning data science and a lot of the other applications so before we start our lecture I just want to give you a side note on how this class will be run during the lecture I will be giving some I will be doing some live coding so that you can get a glimpse of how to apply what you have learned in the class. So to help you better, um, the platform that I use for this video is called Replit. And you can just click into the link in the description and register a free account in Replit. And then you will be getting the access of all the codes that I've written in this video. And you'll also be able to have a platform to practice your Python programming skill. Now let's get back to the, ch the content of this video. And these is the chapter outlined, the stuff that we'll be going through. Feel free to just go skip to the relevant part if you already know some of the topics. Here. So let's proceed to the first subtopic, which is variables and constants. The definition of variable is that variables and constants are a container for storing of values. And once created, the variable is stored in the computer memory and it can be used. Think of it as a box that stores a value and you can take out the value whenever you want to. And the way to create a variable in Python is very simple. So let us close this tab and move on to our Python code. So this will be the code that you see once you register your account in Replit. And to create a variable, all I have to do let's, let me, is that let's say I want to create a variable name called x. And I want to store a value of 5 in this variable. So all I have to do is just um, assign this value to the variable, which is the name declare on my left hand side. And this will create the variable. Let's say I want to print this value out. So I want to print x. So the value that will be, will be printed, let's see, it will be the value 5 because 5 is what we stored in the container named x and we can refer to it anytime that we want by just um, using referring it to its variable so let's say if i were to create another variable called y equal to 3 and i want the sum of x plus y so i can just do print out the sum of them and i should get the value of 8 and if i were to change the value of the variable x to 6 instead of printing 8 the Python program will print 9 instead. So this is a um, variable. We will definitely look into more of its usages, but it's one of the most powerful um, feature of a programming language. So there is two types of so-called name data source. First one is a variable and followed by the constant. Variable is a name that I thought that contains a value that may change during the execution of the program. Whereas constant is the opposite. Once you assign a value to a constant, you wouldn't want to change the content inside of it. So I have an example here um, to show you how to write, how to declare a constant and a variable in pseudocodes. So these are the syntax. For a variable, you just have to write the declare keyword followed by um, the name of the variable and the data type. And constantly, you just have to write the constant keyword, the name of the variable, and the values. So let me show you an example of how variables and constants can, can be different in a programming codes. So this, I have a bunch of code here in which I already copy pasted into my repo. So let me, so one way you can run this code is just delete this three dots. So a way for us to just isolate this code from running. And right now we just want to run in this code. So I have copied the code here from here to this part. And I have two variables. One is the total price and the other one is ticket price. Do know that um, we have to give a variable a suitable name by just putting VAR at the back of the name. Um, Python won't check, check this internally. It, it is just for us to um, determine whether this name data source is a variable or constant. And 
here I have two constant. I have one constant and a variable here with their respective value, 0 and 25. And what this program does is that we will ask the user how many tickets do you want to buy and calculate the ticket total ticket price based on the quantity. So let me run this program and show you how it works. So enter the number of tickets. Um, we know that the ticket price has a value of 25. So if I were to enter value for I want four tickets, the total price should be 100. Right, it doesn't show anything here because I haven't printed out yet. So let me print it out. And let's say four, it will print out the value 100. So this is how um, a program would work, but we're going to input and output later. Then the key point here is the difference between variable and constant. If you notice here, initially the total price variable has a value of zero. But after the program runs, when I print this out again, this variable, the value has changed from 0 to 100. And this is one example of how variable is used. That is, their value will change over time. Whereas for ticket price cons, um, it signifies that the value that is stored inside this variable will always be 25, unless we want to change the ticket price. So if I were to print this um, price constant, print this constant out. So you can, you'll be able to see that, okay, let me in and number of tickets for, and you can see that 25 have been printed. The value has not changed. Whereas the total price variable, because we need to update its price, therefore this value has changed. So that's just a small illustration of what is the difference between a variable and a constant. Um, do know that in other programming language, you can write a, in, let's say in Java, you can write a var in front of your variable to just let the program know that this is a variable and not a constant. But in Python, they do not have this function. Therefore, we name it, we choose naming as a way for us to differentiate between variable and constant. So let's proceed to the second um, subtopic of this chapter, which is basic data type. And before we code out the different data types that we can use in Python. Just want to go through what are, what are the reason we have um, data types. And the reason is that in order for a computer system to process and store data effectively, different kinds of data are formally given different types so that data can be stored in an appropriate way. If you remember in chapter one, one thing that we mentioned is that computer can understand only binaries. So we have this binary here, 1100001, and it can mean two very different things, right? If it is in ASCII, it will mean, it will represent the character A, whereas if this value is to represent a number, it will be 97 in binary. Therefore, we give each data in programming language a type so that we know how to differentiate them. And also, data can also be manipulated properly, for instance, if our data type is a number, which is also known as an integer, when we sum two of these numbers up, the computer knows that I need to do, let's say, 3 plus 5 equal to 8. Whereas if your data type is a character instead, and when you use the plus symbol, the computer knows that it needs to concatenate these two characters. And another thing is for auto-validation. We'll go through more of that later. So, but for now, I just want to introduce you the five data types of um, in programming. First, for, first is the integer, which is a whole number. It can be either positive or negative, followed by real or float, which is a decimal number. And char stands for character, which is a short form for character. And string, uh, that means a bunch of characters formed together to, that is of a word. As you can read here, strings vary in length and may even have no characters, known as an empty string. And boolean is a constant that can only have one or two values, either true or false. So these are some of the examples of all the different data types. So I'm going to show you how to declare orders one by one in REPL, which is pretty simple. So since we're not using it, I will delete this. So different data types. So feel free to code along if you want to, but do remember to erase this three dots so that you can run your codes. And let's do integer. Um, let's say you want to declare 
a variable that contains the value of 10. You can just write, um, I want a number, a number equal to 10. And this number variable will then store the value 10. So what about real? Let's say I want to create a num real number. I can do 10.2. So this is a way first to declare a real number or what you call decimal in mathematics, followed by char. Char is a bit special. Instead of just writing one character here, you need to do something extra different, which is to enclose this character with a single quote. All right, so that's the rule of Python. And as for string, let's say I want to create a string, a string, I can just, instead of just writing, um, let's say I want to have um, eating, the word, word eating, instead of writing this, you will need to enclose it with a double quote. Do note, look at the difference between single quote um, which is used in character and also um, what a string has, a double quote. And the last but not least, a boolean. You can either put a value true or double. Remember it's in capital letter. Or you can create another one called false. So these variables will have these value in, in their variable. And these are the different data types available in Python. So just some quick tests here to know, to make sure you understand um, what are the different data types available. So what do you think this data type is? It is, it has many characters, it's enclosed by double quote, and we know that it is a string. So another question, we have 35.2, what data type is this? So we know that it is a real data type. The last question, integer cosset 10.52, just know that um, we'll go through more, but what this does is basically to convert decimals into whole numbers. So we know that it will be an integer. So these are just some data types that you'll be using along the way while you are learning Python. So that's all about data type. So let's move on to input and output. Also one of the very important elements of programming, not just in Python, but also in many other programming. So let's go through what an input and output is. Its main function is to take input from a keyboard and output to a screen. Look at all the programs here. Imagine that we don't have any mechanism to ask the user for an input, then the program, the program will only run as in, in just one way automatically without any variation. So with input, we can decide what, how the program will be run depending on what the user key in. So here is, um, if you still remember what we talked about in chapter seven, pseudocode, this is how we ask for an input in pseudocode. And to do this, the exact same thing in Python code, I've referred, I put in some codes here. Basically, how you can write an input is just the input keywords, parentheses, and then write down your questions. And whatever the user key in will be stored in the age variable. So let me show you how does this work in practice. So you can just um, delete the three button, three dots. And here we have a code that asks a user what is his or her age. And depending on what the user key in, we are going to print out a different message for the user to see. So if I were to run this code, it will first ask, what is your age? And let me see, Let's, let me type 100. All right, I have some bug here. Um, in fact, I need to convert this um, code into an integer because I'm asking for an H. So that's how you can convert an input to an integer. So let's run this code again. If I were to type 100 into my code, then the program will output something called you are an adult. And if I were to run it again, and I key in my input as seven, and they will print out you are a kid. So that's how input and output is useful. That is they allow um, some interactions between the user and also the program. And just to reiterate, how we can ask the user for an input is that, let's say you want to ask the user, what is your name? So you can create a name variable and followed by the input function, input function, just, this is the input functions and put down the question that you want to ask user in this parenthesis. Remember that your, your question is a string, so it has to be enclosed by this double quote. So you can just write, what is your name? 
and print up the user's name upon um, the key in the value. So if I just run this code, I'm going to write my name is James. And yeah, James will be printed out. So this is one another usage of um, input and output. So this is input. So each input needs to be accompanied by a prompt. So this is our prompt, the question that we ask the user. And the question that you ask has to be included in this input parenthesis and closed by double quotes. So whereas for output, um, input can also be in the form of file, which means it doesn't have to be something that we key in here. It can be something that we um, take from the external source, like um, a TXT file or an Excel file, which is widely used in the field of data science. But we'll talk about this in our last subchapter. So this is how we can ask for input. Here we have to notice is that all input defaults as strings, which means Whatever, in when we use the input function, we can only key in a string. Even if we were to key in a number, let me go through this. Even if I were to key in a number when they ask for my name, this number will be converted into string as well. So it will be converted from five to string in five. So the default data types for the input function is they only take strings. So what, what happened if you want an integer instead, if you want to force the user to key in that's like their age, what is your age? And you don't want the user to key in other things like, um, let, let's see, um, let me run this code. So I have a program that asks the user for, it, for his, his or her age, and I don't want him to just write down a um, non-acceptable answer. And one way we can do this is to put in the int function, the int function, and closing the question. So what this int function does is that whatever the user key in, it will be converted into the integer data type, which is a number data type. So this is useful because if right now the user were to key in something that is not a number, let me see. Let's say the user key in SIH6, but in terms of string, the program will then print out an arrow to the user that, hey, you need to key in a variable. So if I run this again and I key in a variable six, and it will then print out the value six. So this is how we um, enforce some rules on what are the types of um, data that we can accept. And you can also accept a float. Let's say you want to um, record ask the user, what is your height, height in meter? And you want to accept a decimal number. So let me change it into height variable. So instead of using int, you can change it to float so that this question will accept something like 16.1.70. No, and then they will print out a float variable, which is a real number. Float is used when you want to have a real data type input. So this is input. And for output, it's very, very simple. Um, I've already been using it because we need output because for a program to be useful, the user needs to know what results are being output. Just like what we did here, we want to print out what the user has key in, some useful information. So each output needs to be accompanied by a message explaining the result. And the way we do output is by using the print keyword here. Okay, so that's how output works. So let's do some programming now. So um, in your repo sheet, you should be able to look at this instruction file. If you couldn't find it, you can just go to plus, select markdown, and you should be able to see the question that um, we will be doing to practice. So I strongly suggest anyone watching this video to just pause the video and try to attempt all this questions here because the best way to learn programming is not by listening to someone teaching but by attempting the questions here so um just open any files here so i'm attempting question number one so i'll open this question so what this task requires us to do is that we need to write a program that calculate the volume of a sphere and we we know that the formulas of a sphere is this your task is to create a program that asks the user for the radius of a sphere and then calculate its volume. That program must output a message showing the result calculator. So 
to do this, first of all, what we need is that we need to request for a radius input from the user. And I will just create a radius variable. And I want the user to key a decimal number for this. So I'll just ask, firstly, I'll put right down my question. What is the radius using the input function? And enclose this input by a float so that the user key in a decimal or a real number. And the following step is pretty simple. We just need to use whatever the radius is and calculate the volume using the formulas. So I'm going to create a volume formulas, volume variable, and just do the stuff. So I'm going to use 4 over 3. Um, by the way, this is how you can create fractions in programming, 4 divided by 3. And multiply by pi. So multiply, the way you multiply is to use this star symbol by 3.142 with a pi value. And again, multiply by our radius. So the question here is how do we power up this radius? And the way to do this is instead of using one star for multiplication, you can just use two star. This stands for radius to the power of three. And after that, I can just print out my answer. And let me run this. Oops. Oh, I made a mistake here. Let me stop this. OK, to run this code, since these files are in a different um, file, this code are in a different files, you need to go to the shell column and key in Python, followed by the file name here. OK, so I'll just key in the file name. And yeah, by the way, you can just press tab to, to get the full art without typing everything. Just tap, you will get a shortcut. And let me key in the radius here to test out if our program works. Got 3.5. And yeah, they will just print out the volume for us. So here you go for those of us who, who tried programming for the first time. And this is the first program that you have created, a program that calculates the volume of a sphere based on the radius is like a calculator. So let's move on to second question. Um, this question is quite similar. Instead of a sphere, you need to calculate the volume of a cylinder. And this time you need to ask for the radius and also the height. So let's move on to um, another file here just to avoid clutter. So first of all, we need to ask the user for a radius. I'm going to input what is the radius and enclose it with a float function to convert it into a real number, followed by the height. So again, input, what is the height? And convert it to a float again. So to calculate the volume, the formula is pi r squared h. So again, I create a volume variable. I use 3.142, which is the pi value, multiplied by radius, power of 2, and multiplied by the height. And eventually, I'll just print out the volume. So let's go to shell, get Python. Um, because the file name starts with the letter B, you can just press B and followed by tab instead of typing everything. And that should work. And what it will ask us, what is the radius? 5.3, what is my height? 9.2. And they will just print out the volume of the cylinder. So that's it. That's just two very simple programs that we write to calculate the volume. So um, I do encourage you to try it out yourself um, because watching other people code might not be very fun unless you do it yourself. So let's move on to the next subtopic, which is some of the programming fundamentals, which are super duper fun to learn. And let's go through each of these topics one by one, and I'll show you why are they so useful. So. First part is um, the importance of sequencing in your programming. So here they said that the ordering of the steps in an algorithm is very important. An incorrect order can lead to incorrect results or extra steps that are not required by the task. So this is the program that we have written just now to calculate the volume of a sphere. So if you were to reverse this process, the program wouldn't work. Think of sequencing as um, the process where codes run. Imagine that the process is to fry an egg, you're frying an egg, and these are the steps that you would be doing. Heat up the pan, pour in the oil, crack the egg, and add the egg into the pan, and then you eat. Right, that's the right step to fry an egg. But if you were to um, do it, if you were to reverse the sequence or to just switch the sequence up, everything would just mess up, 
right? We have here step one, crack the egg and add the egg into the pan before even heating up. And you know that the egg wouldn't um, taste that nice. So similarly in programming, let's say this is my, the sequence of my programming code. I ask for a radius, ask for height, calculate the volume and print out the volume. This is correct, the correct sequence for our program. But if you were to reverse it, if you were to calculate the volume first before asking for radius and height, the program will probably crash. Will crash because the program didn't know what the value of the radius is and also even the height. So this is why sequencing is very important. So let me illustrate. Um, if I were to move this code up, which means I calculate the volume first before I receive the radius and height as input. Let's see what will happen. So I'll run this code. See, this is the arrow code that um, they will show us. They will say that the name radius is not defined and we are trying to use it. So this is um, how important um, the sequencing of a program is. So let's proceed to um, selection which is the if else statement that you all learn in chapter seven. So in another fundamental construct in programming is the ability for the code to make a decision to, or to ask a question. Usually there are several possible options. So for instance, you can write a program that asks the user whether you like football. Let's say you want to create a mini YouTube um, application. And if the user likes football, you're going to show him or her football videos. If not, you will show other videos. So there's a selection in um, process. So in pseudocode, this is how we write our selection code. We have if h blah 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 our condition, then we'll run this code, else we'll run this code, followed by an and if. And the way to do it in Python is a lot simple. It's just it's the same keyword. If what is the condition here, then you do this, followed by the else statement, and you do this. Or a case statement. So this is how the case statement will work in pseudocode. And um, unfortunately, Java Python doesn't have a um, else state, um, switch statement. Therefore, this if elif code is used instead for a switch statement. Basically, used when you have multiple conditions that you want to meet. And let's do some programming to properly understand how if else statement work. So we have a question here, question um, odd or even. So what this question requires you to do is that you need to uh, write a program that asks the user for a number. And depending on the number that the user key in, you are going to print out whether the number entered is an even number or, a, or an odd number. So one tip that um, you need to know before doing this question is that all even numbers, all even numbers, when divided by two, will have a remainder of zero. Remainder of zero. And just think about all the even number now, 18, 16, 21, 22. And when you divide by two, you won't get any remainder, right? Whereas all for all the odd numbers, odd numbers, you will get a remainder of one when you divide the number by two. So um, in Python, there's a pretty useful to a function for us to know whether a number has a remainder when divided by a certain number. Let's see, let us, um, which is the percentage symbol. If I were to um, key in two numbers, six percentage two, what this code does, six percentage two does is that it will use six divided by two and then print out its remainder. So if I were to try to run this code and I just write Python C tap, and I'll see that zero is being printed out. And if I were to do seven percentage two, you know that seven divided by two, you have a remainder of one, right? So let's test it out. And a one is printed out instead. So by using this information, we can solve this question pretty easily, which means, so first of all, we ask the user for a number. So I'm gonna ask the user, what is your number? Again, very importantly, since we're asking for a number, we have to, cast it and put in in function and if the number when they are divided by two and i'm using this percentage sign to get the remainder of it when this number is divided by two 
is equal to zero. This means that it is an even number. All right. So I'll print out it is an even number. And else, else if the number when um is divided by two, the remainder is not zero. I will print out the value. Um, it is an odd number. So let us try to run this program and see whether it works. All right, I should do this instead. So Python C. So um, one number that I want to enter is 10, which is an even number. And it should print out the value. It is an even number. If I were to run it again, I key in the value 9. And they will print out a message saying it is an odd number. And this is how um, selection is being used. So we first write the if keyword followed by a conditions that will be either true or false. Do you, see, do you remember that when we are comparing two values here, um, instead of using one equal, we are using two equal, which is a comparison operators here. And this is how Python work. So um, this is how um, selection is being used. So we have another question here is, um, we need to write a program that asks the user for a character. And we need to determine whether the character is a vowel or it is a consonant. A vowel means the character is either A, E, I, O, or U. So in this case, we can't use if else because we have more than one conditions. So we need to use what is being discussed here, the if elif statement, which I will show you how I use it to solve this problem. So I have another code here. So first of all, we need to ask the user, what is their character? So I'm going to create a character variable. Just ask the user for what is your character, all right? And I need to check. So what the, the question asks that we identify the vowel so that we need to check whether this character is equal to first, is it equal to A or is it equal to E or I or U? So I'm going to write the if statement if character is equal to, all right, instead of doing this, by now you should know that we can't just write character in this way because character is, a, they have their own data type. So we need to enclose it with a single quote, followed by a colon, that's the syntax of Python programming language. And if the character is equal to A, um, what the program said is that we should print out the vowel character if it is a vowel. So I'm gonna print A instead. So I'm gonna print out the value A, and instead of writing else here, since I need to check whether it is an E, I, O, U, I'm going to write elif, stand for else if, followed by our condition, is character equal to E. If so, I'm going to print out the E character, followed by um, I, O, U, equal to I, and I'm going to print out the I character, and elif character is equal to O, then I'm going to print out the O character. All right, I press zero. And U, elif, another elif. So the good thing about elif is that we can write um, however much time that we want to, and we have to print U. And the final requirement of the program is that if the character is a consonant, like P, or Q, or R, we need to print out a message saying that this is a consonant. So we can just write the else statement. Else basically covers everything that is not A, that is not E, I, O, or U. So if it's not any of these vowels, I'm going to print out this is a consonant. So if I were to run this code, I'm going to write Python, D, and then we run this. And if I were to change, let's try it out with a vowel, I. And they'll just print out the vowel character, I. So then let us run it again. And now we give it a consonant, let's say P. And the program will print out a message saying that this is a consonant. So that's pretty much it. We have created a program that detects whether the user input is a vowel character or a consonant character. And that's all about selection. Of course, there will be harder things in the future, but um, let's do this for now. And let's proceed to the next very important funda programming fundamentals, which is iteration. So iteration takes place in the algorithm when the rules determine that a step or step should be repeated until a condition is met or until told to stop. 
So um, this is the algorithm just for fun for frying five eggs. So you need to heat up the pan, pour in oil, crack the egg, and add, add the egg into the pan, put the fried egg on a plate. So if you were to fry five eggs, you probably need to repeat step three and four for five times, right? So that's what iteration means. We know that in programming, we have we need to instruct the um, programs what are the steps needed to take in. But sometimes we, when we need to repeat certain steps, this is when iteration or in other words, loop comes in. And there are three types of loops um, in iterative programming, count control loop, precondition loop, post condition loop. And let's start off with count control loop, something that you should be very familiar with if you have watched my chapter seven videos. So this is the type of loop where the number of loops or iteration is already decided. A counter is used to record how many times the iteration has occurred. This time of loop is known as a for loop. So this is um, a program written in pseudocode to print out the value from one to 10. And just a recap here. Um, first of all, we declare the variable, the counter variable, and another value to declare whether what is, what is the stopping point for our program. And the next counter will increment the counter by one. And how we do this in Python, um, this is the syntax. First of all, we need to write the four keywords, followed by the variable that is being used as a counter. Do note that this doesn't have to have the name counter, it can be anything. And followed by the in range keyword. So this is the key part where um, we decide how we want to iterate our program. So the, one, the first value in the range function is the starting value of the counter variable. And the second value is that it was the program will detect whether the counter variable reaches this value. If, if yes, the program will end. And the third step is the steps incremented to the counter variable at each iteration. How much you add to the counter variable. Um, just a note here you, that you don't have to specify step if the value is one. So let me run the Python code for you to see um, how powerful loop can be, all right? So let's erase this stuff and this selection code that we don't need. So I have an iteration code written here. So what this program does is that um, it would declare a variable called the counter with the starting value of one. And at each iteration, the counter value will, will be incremented by one until it reaches the value 10. And at each iteration, the counter value is being printed. So if I were to go back to my console and I run my program, you see that the value one um, until nine is printed. You might ask why is not why is ten not printed, right? So how Python work is that once the counter value reaches ten, the program will stop. Therefore, the code the program doesn't run this line of code when the counter is already ten. So just some tweaks. If I were to change this ten into twenty, um, you see that we will print the value from one to nineteen. Basically, this line of code are being iterated over and over again. And just a side note, we don't need to put one if we don't want to, because um, in Python, the default increments is one. But what if I were to use an increment of two? And just pause the video and think about what would be printed out. We have a starting value of one. At each step, this counter variable is going to be incremented by two. So let me run this code. And you shall see that the value one instead is printed out. Instead of followed by two, it's followed by three because our counter variable is incremented by two at a time. One plus two equal to three. So this is the Python code that is used for a for loop, a predefined loop. Yep. So this is what we receive when we run um, the code here from one until nine. And if I were to move the change the step to two, we'll get one, three, five, seven, nine instead. So just a comparison of how the difference between for loop in pseudocode and Python code looks like. And the other types of loop that we need to learn is the precondition loop. They are a type of loop that may have no iteration at all. All right, so this is the precondition loop written in pseudocode, just a recap. This is where a condition must be true before the loop or operation takes place. This type of loop is known as a var loop. Whereas if you look at this program, what it does is that 
it will repeatedly ask the user to input a mark variable. And while the mark is not equal to one, the program will just do this over and over again. All right. So this is the condition that must be met before the indented code can be run. And this is the indented code. So if the user were to key in a mark um, equal to negative one here, the program would then end. So this is how we do the while loop, also known as the precondition loop in Python. We have a while keyword and followed by a condition that is either true or false. So the, what the above program does is that we will keep adding what the user enters until the user key in the value negative one and the total will be printed. So if I were to run this code and show you how it works, again, um, you can delete this. So let's run this code. And yep, um, the promise that enter your mark negative one to finish, if I were to key in um, 90, I'm going to print 90. And can you see that the program asked me another question again? It just won't stop asking me question 65, 78, until I key in a value negative one. And it will then print out the total of all the values that I have, I have input. So if you were to go into this code, you'll see that this is how it works. First of all, we declare a variable called total and a mark variable that stores the user input. So this is the keyword here, a while keyword, is that what, what it does is it checks whether mark is, is it not equal to negative one, which means it's equal to other values. If this is the condition is true, this code will be run over and over again. The mark will be added to the total and the program will ask me, us for a value again until we key in the value negative one. If I were to key in the negative, value of negative one, this condition will be false and the indented code here will no longer be run and the printed, the total will be printed. So this is um, how an example of how a while loop works. So the, another word for iteration is loop. Um, so this is the third types of iteration, which is the post condition loop. Um, if you remember what we learned in pseudocode, this is what repeat until syntaxes. This is where a condition must be true after the loop or operation takes place. It can be implemented using the repeat until loop in pseudocode. So just a recap here, what this code does is that it will repeat the code, the indented code here, run it over and over again until mark is equal to negative one. And this code will run at least one time because we only check the conditions at the end of the code. And this is known as the post condition loop. So this is the explanation. The indented code will be run repeatedly until the condition is being met. Um, unfortunately, Python doesn't have post condition loop. I have included a snapshot on how post condition loop looked like in the Java programming language. So this chunk of code inside this curly braces will be run repeatedly while this is equal to true as a post condition loop. So let's do some programming question to consolidate our learning in this chapter. So the question that we are going to attempt here is the multiple of three questions. So this is the first question. So you need to use a for loop to output the first five multiples of three. So your program should output the following three, six, nine, 12, and 15. So let's go to the multiple of three file. So to do this question, uh, we need a for loop. So for, and the variable that I want to use is my value. Let's use the value, this name in range. So that's the keyword. Remember the first number that we key in will be the starting value of this value variable. Since I want the multiple of three, my starting value should be three. And my ending values, since I want to print it until the value 15, I'm gonna increase it to 16 instead. So that it stops when the value is above the value 16. And my step, I want my value count variable to increment it by three each step because I'm looking for multiple of three. I'm gonna write three here. And for each iteration, just print out the value. And if I were to run this code, 
and I write Python E tap. And as you can see, the value tree until 15 is being printed out. So that's um, just a simple program to print out multiple of three. And if you want to print out multiple of four, you can change the starting value to four, um, increment by four. Let's say you want to print five, um, the last value should be 20. So you're going to end at 21. So if I were to run this code again, you see that I have changed the printing sequence. All right. So that's how um, we attempt this question. And the second question is, again, a very simple question. Use the for loop, which is a count control loop, to output a counter from 10 to 0. Your program should output as the diagram below, which means you have to print out the value from 10 to 0. So let's try to do it in for loop. For that, let me use the same variable name for value in range. So what do you think we should put here? What should be our starting value if we want to count down from 10 to 0? Of course, we need to start with the value 10 because this is the first value we want to print out. And what about the ending values? I'm going to put negative 1 here. Um, so from this question, you should be able to see that a for loop doesn't only go up in values, it can also go down. And this is where the third value comes in handy. What should be your increment step? Since I want to print, I want to decrease the value one by one, I'm going to put negative one as my incremental value. And this is how we do this. So I'm going to print this and let's run this program. Python F tab. And you can see that, boom, we have a countdown. We print, just printed the number from 10 to zero. And this is how we do a countdown timer in Python. So let me clear this. So let's proceed to the next question. It's the same question, but the, t the question requires you to use a while loop instead. Use a while loop to output a countdown from 10 to 0. And I'm going to show you how to do this in the exact same file. So to do this, I need to create a variable called value, let's say 10. And what I want to do is that I want to create a while loop that will stop when this value reaches zero. I'm going to do while value is equal, is less than zero. It's less than zero. If this condition meet, okay, should be more than zero, more than or equal to zero, I'm going to print out the value zero. So um, how does this work is that I want this value to be true um, for this line of code to be run. Because this is what the question one, right? We want to print every number until it reaches the value zero. So starting from 10, value 10 here, um, in each iteration, I'm going to print out the value. And I have an arrow here, but I'm going to run this code anyway to show you how bad this code is. So I'm going to run this. And you should see that the value 10 is being printed over and over and over again. It has been printed out many, many times. All right, so I'm going to delete this to just show you how it works. All right, so I'm going to close this shell because it has crashed. So what is the problem of our code just now is that because the value of 10, the, the value of the value variable, that's not a very good variable name, um, is always 10. Therefore, this code will always run and it will not stop. But our instruction is our program should stop when the value reaches zero. So what we need to do is that at each iteration, after we print out the value, we need to decrease the value by one so that ultimately the while loop will stop. So I'm going to write this here. So let's run this code again, Python, F, tab, And you see that, boom, the same code has been run. And this is how we use the while loop. While followed by the while loop, while keyword, it should be a condition to be met. Right, so that's all the questions we have for a while loop counter. All right, I have two more questions, which is which you can use iterations on. Write a program that asks the user to input numbers repeatedly until the user keys in a positive value. So what happened is that you are, you are going to ask the user for a number repeatedly until the user key in a negative value, um, a positive value. So I have this file here. If, 
And um, how I'm going to do it is that first, I need to ask the user for a number, number variable, integer input, and just key in, what is your number? What is your number? And what we can do here to ask the user again and again is to use the while loop. While this number is, since we want a positive number, which means if they are not positive, less than zero, I will ask the user for a number again. I'm going to print out a message saying, hey, I want a positive number. So after this, I will just write down the exact same line of code to ask the user for a question again. What is your number? So if I were to run this code, um, and if the condition is met eventually, I'm going to print out the number. So if I were to run this code, Python G tap. And yeah, they will ask me for a number. Let's me see. Let's say I came in a negative 99, a negative number. And boom, they will say, I want a positive number, right? Um, let's say I want to key in another value, negative 35. It will keep asking me this question until I give a positive number. And this is while loop in action because number is never more than zero. That's why this code is still running. So I'm going to key in a positive value, 10. And look what happened. And then it will print out the number 10 and the program will halt. And this is how we solve this question. All right, so followed by another, the last question on iteration. Write a program that asks users to input numbers repeatedly until the user key in a positive number. Using the positive number, calculate the sum from zero up to n. So with, this means that if the user were to key in a positive value five, we are going to calculate the sum from five, four, three to one. We're just gonna add them up and get the values. So I'm gonna copy this code here because we have already written down the codes that force the user to input a positive number. So I'm gonna write down here, number, what is your number? So assume that now we have the number in positive. So what we can do to calculate the sum is to use the for loop. You can use both, but I prefer the for loop. For counter equal in range, um, my starting value should be want because I want to start from want. And I want my ending value to be the number that the user has key in plus one. And each of them should increment by one. And prior to this, I should create a total variable that stores the total of the sum. And I'm going to add this total equal to total plus whatever that is my counter. And at each iteration, the total variable will be updated with the next counter value until it reaches number plus one. And the reason I use number plus one is because Python will stop when the counter is equal to number. So I'm going to just run this code to show you how it runs. Um, I'll, I'm going to run the hish code, hish tab, sum to n. Um, let's say I want to key in a negative number, negative four, and they will say I want a positive number, so I'm going to key in the value three. So what happened is that um, the value will pass, or oh, I forgot to print out the total value, sorry about that, total. So I'm going to run this code again. I'm going to key in the value three, and you'll see that six is being printed out. And what happened behind the hood is that Python is adding up the value from one plus two plus three. Therefore, we have the value of six. So what if I tried out with another value? So um, let me do five. And you'll see that 15 is being printed out because one plus two plus three plus four plus five will be equal to 15. So that's um, how I solved the sum to n question. So this is all about iteration. And we are going to proceed to totaling and counting. There wouldn't be a lot of coding from now on. Um, so totaling is a concept that we learn in uh, Python and also in pseudocode in chapter seven. It's used to add up one number to an existing store number, usually contained in two different variables. And to do totaling, you'll always need to create a variable as the container to store your sum. And in this program, what it does is that, just like what we do in the last question here, 
it sums up the value to total. By the way, this is the syntax to mean, um, so instead of writing total plus counter, I can actually do this and they will give me the same thing. This is equivalent to total plus counter. All right, they are both the same thing. And this is totaling in action, um, which we'll be using very, very frequently. And also counting, instead of um, adding up whatever the sum here, counting is more on checking how many iterations a program has performed in a loop. So that's totaling and counting. And the next one step that we're going to learn is called string handling. So if you remember, a string is a value like that. So this is a string, which is basically a bunch of characters concatenated together. And let's see what are some of the operations that we can take to handle string. So first of all, um, the first function that we can use is the length function to find out the number of characters in a string. This is how we do this in pseudocode, whereas in Python, it's very, very simple. You just enclose our text with a length function, and the length of this text will then be stored in this value variable. And I'm going to show you how it works. So I have a sample string here, a, b, c, d, f, g, until k. If I want to know what is the length of the sample string, let me um, store my length counter variable. All right, I'm going to create this variable and assign it with the value of length, my sample string. So I just basically put whatever this variable into my length function, which is enclosed by this parenthesis. And if I were to print out the value inside this length counter, and I'll find that um, this value will print out a, the length of this string, which is 11. All right, so that's how we use the length function for string. So followed by the substring function, which is a way for us to extract a part of the string. And let's say we only want to extract one character. Um, I have A to K here. And in Python, do remember that for each character, they have their respective identifier, which is also known as index. So if let's say from this string, you only want to extract the character F, what you can do is to look up the index of this character and, and close it with a close bracket followed by the number. So let, let, let us just do it here. Um, so imagine that I want to um, extract this character C. Um, since the index starts from zero, if I want the character C, I will need to choose the value two. So let us do this. Let's assign the character. Um, I just write sample string sample string. And you, instead of a parenthesis that we have been using very frequently, we use a square bracket and enter the index number that we want to access the character from. So in this case, it's two, um, which will give us, should give us the character C. And I'll just print it out, print whatever that is inside the character. And you will see that the value C is being printed out. If I were to change this to um, two, it will one which is the second character, it will print out the B character instead. So this is how I extract just one character from a string. So that what if you said you want to extract a range of character, let's say you want from B to D. Um, in Python, since index start at zero, that's what we already discussed. We can use, if we want a range of character, we can use this data format. Whereas the X is the starting position and Y is the ending position. All right. So do know that this ending position, just like for loops, if you were to choose from zero to two, zero to three, it will only print out the value ABC. It's non-inclusive. So let's try it out. Let me write, create a variable called the substring and use the sample string variable and um, let's say I want to have the first element, which is index zero, until the third element. So zero, one, two, three. So I'm going to end at three. It will, should print out the value A, B, C. So let's try it out. And as you can see, A, B, C is being printed out instead. All right. Do remember that the third character, 
the character in index tree will not be printed out. It is exclusive. And this is how we extract a range of character from a string. Um, of course, this is how we do it in pseudocode, just for your reference. So um, another two very important, not very important, but very simple functions of string handling is the ability to make all the character uppercase or lowercase. So we have uppercase, we also have lowercase. And the, met the way we do this is very simple. Let me create an uppercase variable. And I can just write down my sample string and followed by a dot upper parenthesis. By the way, this is um, a way function work. And if I were to print out this uppercase, I will see that all characters printed should be in uppercase. All right. Or what if, let's say, you have another sample string, which is in all, which are all in capital letter, and you want to lower it down? Um, again, you can do something very similar to what we just did, but instead of doing dot upper, you can do dot lower. And this is how you can print out the value. So if I were to do this again, you will see that the value that's printed out here, they are all, oh, I used the wrong string. Let me do it again. So if I run this code, you should see that all characters printed have been converted from uppercase to lowercase. So that's all about string handling. So now we have um, a, a few more fundamentals to go through, which is arithmetic, logical, and Boolean operators. So this is all the arithmetic operators that we have been using along the way. We have plus, minus, multiply, etc. So these are all the symbols that you can use in doing programming. Uh, we have already been using power and remainder. This is integer division. Um, the difference is that it will just give, okay, let's try it out, arithmetic operation. Um, so let's try it out the plus operator, all right? Let's say I create, I have two variable, x equal to three, y equal to two. And when I print out x plus y, they should give us a value of five, all right? Well, if your character is x, a is equal to, let's say, character of A, B is equal to character B. And if you were to use the op arithmetic operator on a character, Python will concatenate instead. It should print out the value AB. All right. So um, I won't go through this one by one. Feel free to try it out yourself and see how these operators work in Python. All right. So we have a few questions to attempt. Um, feel, this is find a value of plus, we'll skip this for now. And let's do only question number three. Find the remainder when 1980 is divided by seven. And the way we can find remainder, again, is to use the percentage symbol. So I'm gonna use 1980 percentage seven, and the remainder of it will be printed out. So we can see that six has been printed out. You can check the calculator to verify it. So. And we have already done this, adding two characters. So feel free to just try it out in your repo program and practice your skill. And besides arithmetic operators, we also have the logical operators. Uh, we have more than, less than, equal, greater than, or not equal. So what this logical operator does is that they will give us, they will return a value of either true or false. So let me, let us try it out. Um, if I were to print out the value of is 5 equal to 3, and when I run this code, um, you can see that true is being printed out. We are used, since we are using a logical operator, it's, the return value will either be true or false. And it's also often used in selection because comparison operators are being used very frequently. All right? So that's um, logical operators, and we have a lot of comparison operators here too. And followed by the Boolean operators, this is when um, we combine multiples, multiple Booleans, multiple conditions together. All right, I'm gonna show you in code to better explain this. So just now what we did is, we know five is greater than three, it will print out the value of true, right? But what if I want to make sure that two conditions that I put is true? So let's say I have another condition, I want to know whether 5 is greater than 3 is true. And 
I want, I can use this and keyword to check whether two conditions are true. It will only be printed, the true value, the value will only be true if two conditions here are true. So if I run into this code, of course I'll print out the value true because 5 equal to true is true and 7 greater than 4 is also true. But let's say if I were to write down this 3 greater than 4, which is false, what we have here is we're going to have the value true and false. And the result of this logical, this operating, a operation is that a false will be printed out instead. Because and require both conditions to be true in order to be true. Whereas besides and, we could also have the or operator. If I were to switch this to the or instead, you'll find that true will be printed out because now we have true or false. So it only requires one true in order for it to, to have the true values. Okay, so that's the arithmetic operators followed by the logical operators um, and the Boolean operators. And they are very useful. All right, so now we'll be talking about nested statements in programming. So sometimes it's necessary to execute one if statement followed by another, then followed by another. This is when nested selection is needed. So on my left here, you can see that this is a normal if statement. If the number is greater than 50, you print out a message saying that. If not, you print out that the number is less than 50. And on my right here, you can see that this is a nested if statement. As the name implied, it is an, an if, st if statement nested inside an if statement. So what this code does here, if you see there is an if statement, if else statement here, embedded under this if statement. So if number is greater than 50, what this code does is that it will ask again whether if the number is greater than 50, 75. If so, we say number is too big. If not, we say number is more than 50. So this is a way for us um, to handle more conditions if required. So this is how we use a nested if statement. Um, basically an if statement within an if statement as illustrated by this slide here. So this is um, how the code works. So besides nested state um, selection, we also have nested iteration, which uh, implies that we have another iteration inside one iteration. So this normal loop here, what it does as shown um, in the previous section of the video, it print out the value counter equal to one followed by two and when the counter value reaches three, the loop will then stop. And it's quite simple here. But what would happen if we were to put in a false statement within a false statement, for loop statement? And we can see that they are within each other because it starts not in the first line, but um, it's indented. So let me go through this code very, very quickly to show you what will be printed out in this code. So first of all, we know that counter one, this is the output bar, counter one will be printed. So the next line of code is this for loop statement here. All right, it will print out the value another counter equal to one. And instead of going back to this for loop here, because we have an inner loop, what it, the program does it will, is that it will return to the inner loop instead and then do another round of another counter, another counter equal to two, and increment um, the loop will then stop here. It will move back to the outer loop and print out counter equal to two, followed by the inner loop, another counter one, another counter two. And this is how um, a nested iteration and simple version of how it works. So I'm gonna show you how to um, run this code in Python, you can um, just delete the code to run it. So this is the exact same code that I've copied from here. And if I were to run this code, um, it will print out what the stuff that I show here. All right. So let's try to tweak a little bit of the statement here. So let's say I want to run the outer loop three times, but the, out, the inner loop five times. And let's see what it will do. So let me run this. 
And you can see that after this counter, this line is being printed, when we run this code, it will run for another uh, four times. It will run four times before we return to the first statement here. That's why it's printed want and another counter it is going to one, two, three, four, and then counter two, one, two, three, four. So that's how nested iteration work. And let's proceed to um, another huge function of programming, also in Python, which is the usage of procedures. Sometimes you call it functions. So when writing an algorithm, there are often similar tasks to perform that make use of the same group of statements. Instead of repeating this statement and writing new codes every time they require it, many programming languages make use of subroutine, also known as procedure or functions. They are defined once, that's the key point, and can be called many times in the program. So let me show you an example. Let's say this is the program that you want your you write, which does the following. It add the it asks the user for a number, add it by five, multiply by three, divide by five, plus hundred, minus twenty, and print out the result. So this your program might look like this. But what happened when you want to do two numbers? Let's say you want to um do it for two numbers, do this exact same operation. One way to do it is to just you know copy and paste the codes and you will get the result. Yet we know that this is not very effective because what if you have 100 numbers to add? Are you going to copy this 100 times? Right? So in programming, we can actually group codes that we want to repeat into something called a procedure slash function. And this is how we do it. So this is the syntax of a function, basically a group of a chunk of code that we want to run again and again without just copy and pasting them. So first of all, you have the dev keyword and you also have, and you give the function a name. This name is useful because this is how we're gonna call the function and followed by a parameters, which is optional. So I'm gonna show you how this works in your code here. So this is what we just discussed. Um, let's say we want to have two value do the same thing. I'm gonna run this code. You're gonna say um, five, it will print out the values after going through all these operations and gonna write six. And this is what happened after the value six go through all these operations, all right? But we don't want to copy and paste so many codes because we, don't, we just want to make our code succinct. So what we can do in Python is to create functions based on this functionality, all right? So I'm gonna write a def function. Um, let's give this function a name called calculation. And I'm going to give it a parameter it's called number, right? Let me delete this. Followed by a semi, a colon. And I'm going to just do the exact same operation here. I'm going to copy this, put it here. All right. And change the naming of it from number to number one to number very, very quickly. And I'm going to show you how powerful this can be. All right. And at last, we're going to print out the number. Okay, so we can do the exact same thing like we do here in just two lines of codes. So think of function as a box that takes in a value. So this function called calculation, it will take in the value and use the value to do all these operations and print out the value. So I'm going to just try it out myself. To call a function, you just write down the function name, calculation and followed by the number you want to put into this function. So um, since I do with the value five just now, I'm gonna put in five and you will see how it does the exact same thing. So um, for now, we can just command this code out to just isolate them. Okay, so I'm gonna run this code. You can see that 95 has been printed. And what if I have two numbers, right? I'm gonna call this function again. And instead of copying the whole code, I can just change the parameter. I'm gonna do six. I'm gonna run the code again. It will print out 95, 96. So this is how useful function is, and you can call this function wherever you are, all right? So this is some basic of functions. So let's go through some of the differences between um, the various types of functions. We have, first of all, the procedure vs function. A procedure is a subroutine that will not return a value. So in our function here, 
this is a procedure. This is a procedure because it does not return any values from upon um, finishing all this line of code, all right? All right, let's create a function that does the same thing, correct? I'm gonna write function here. So I'm gonna create another function called def calculation, give it another name, this is a function, which does the exact same thing, okay? Which does the exact same thing. So I'm gonna copy it here. So what is the difference between procedure and a function is that this function, it has a return keyword. It returns, let's say in this case, I want them to return the result of this number instead of printing it out. I'm gonna return this number function, all right? And let's call this function. What it does is that if you were to do run this code, function calculation function, and I'm gonna put in the value five. Um, you will see that nothing will be printed out, right? Nothing will be printed out because you only return the numbers so to, to this place, but you are not printing out anything. So let me print out these values. Um, and you will see that the value that is returned here, it will return to its color. And when we were to print out this value, you, can, you will see that 95 will be printed out, all right? Al alternatively, you can also assign this return value into a variable. So let's say this is, you want to store it in your result variable. You can write the same thing. Calculation function. And you key in a value five. And the results here will not be printed. Instead, it will be stored into a re the result variable. Uh, if you were to print it out, you will, you will notice that it, it will print out the same thing. Okay, so that's the, difference between procedure and function. Procedure will not return a value. It will just stop here. Whereas a function, it will return the number to its column. So that's procedure versus function. And this is what I have written just now. All right, feel free to have a look. And the other, the types of function is that we have fun functions that takes in a parameters, but also functions that do not take in the parameters. So in our case just now, this function is a function that takes in a parameter. And if you don't have any things to input into this function, you can also create, let's say, create a calculation, um, no parameters that you name it, no parameter. You can, you can just leave it blank and you can do number here instead. And it will, it will be the same over here. And when you are calling this function, you can just write calculations, no parameter, without actually needing to put in anything here. All right, so that's function without a parameter. And run it, it will get the same result. So let's proceed to global and local variable. I've written some codes here, I won't be doing it in REPL. But here are some codes that show you what is the difference between a global and also a local variable. And in, in our case here, we declare a variable here outside of the function n1, n2. These are known as the global variable, which means these variables can be used anywhere in our program. And n1 and n2, as you can see, they are here. They can be used even if you are writing your code inside a function. So these variables are called global variables. All right, whereas if you look at entry here, this variable is declared within a function. So this variable, we call it a local variable. Local, this means that they only can be used locally in the function. So if you were to print, access this entry variable outside of this function, in this case, you'll get an error. Feel free to just copy and paste this code into your REPL and see what you will receive, all right? And you should be receiving an arrow here because entry is not a global variable. It cannot be used outside of the end function. It can only be used locally within a function. So that's um, functions, or you can call them procedure based on their types. So let's do some programming um, for functions. Um, I have created a few questions here. Feel free to try it before looking at my solution. So the first function is, the first task is to write a function that can print one line of stars. In your codes, call the function five times to print five lines of star. Your program should output the followings. So um, 
let's try to do it in the draw star folder. So let's create a function. We started by using def keyword and name it as um, draw star. All right. And since the, the question doesn't require us to take in the parameters uh, for our functions, we can just do it here. And inside our functions will be the codes that we want it to run. So I'm going to print um, a line of stars. Okay. So we have to call it five times. So I'm going to just draw, call the function draw star parenthesis. I'm going to copy and paste this for five times. So the codes here inside this function will be called um, five times. Um, all right, I should run it in a shell. So I'm going to clear this. Python J. Okay, Python J tap. Oops, Python J. So there, apparently there's some problem here. So I have to type in manually star dot py. So I'm going to copy my code to the main folder here because apparently there's some problem. So I'm going to run this code here, copy, delete this. And I'm going to delete all the procedural codes here. And if I were to run this, you'll find that five lines of stars have been printed out. Okay, so um, we have a follow up question for that is that they want to create a function that takes in a number parameter and using the n parameter print out n lines of stars. So if we have three as our parameter, we're going to print out three lines of stars, six, we have to print out six, six lines of stars. So basically we are saying that I want to customize this function to print out any um, many lines of stars. So I'm going to delete this. So we're going to add in a parameter called number. And think of and how we can repeat this line of code for a number of time is that um, I believe you have already guessed it, we can use a for loop. So I'm going to do a for loop for a counter in range um, number. This means this shows that um, it will run for five times. All right, this is some shortcut. And for counter in range number, um, the starting value, you can write it in, but you can also omit it because default is zero. Since we're not using counter, we just want it to run for this number of time. We can just do this. And um, we can just call this function and by putting in a suitable parameters name. So I'm going to run this code. You see that four lines of stars have been printed out. But if I were to change it to ninth, look how easy for us to customize our functions. We're going to get nine lines of stars. So this is how we solve task 1b here, right? Pretty, pretty simple. So um, in second task, our task is to create a Fahrenheit to Celsius function that takes in a Fahrenheit and return a Celsius. So this is the requirement. We need to take in value as parameter and return the result. So we're going to create a function that returns a result. So I'm going to delete this. I have def. Let, let us name it as F2C, stand for F Fahrenheit to Celsius, right? I'm going to take in the Fahrenheit. So what I can do is that I need to calculate the Celsius, right? I'm going to create a Celsius variable and use the formulas given here. I'm going to use Fahrenheit minus 32. Remember to put in a parenthesis to show that you want this um, calculation to run first, all right? Divide by, not divide, multiply by 5 over 9, which is um, a fraction. So that's the formula to calculate. Um, Fahrenheit, convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. And upon getting the result, I just want to return this Celsius to my caller. So I'm going to write return Celsius. And let me show you how to do this. Um, why don't we create a program that asks the user for a Fahrenheit, right? So I'm going to create a uh, user Fahrenheit, user F. I'm going to ask for an integer. All right. What is the Fahrenheit? Okay. And I'm going to, whatever the user key in, I'm going to put it as the parameter of this function. So I will call this FTOC user F. So do know that this is a function that returns the value. So we need to store the result somewhere. So I'm going to put in all this, the value that it returns back to this result variable. And then I'm going to print out um, the result. 
So if I were to run this code, it should be able to work. What is the Fahrenheit? I'm going to type in 90. And yeah, so here's the result um, temperature in Celsius. So this is how we create a function for our program. And that's basically it. OK, so let's proceed to the next part of our lecture, which is called the library routines. So a physical library, it contains tons of book. But what does the, library, the programming library contains, right? So the library of a programming language, they store library routines, which are small blocks of pre-written code, which is function, which is what we just did, that can be called easily and repeatedly. And they are perfectly programmed routine that can be called upon at any time with no pre-programming required and are designed to handle some of the most common problem when writing any software. So I'm going to show you just um, one type of library routine here. So if you remember um, when we're doing the string handling topics, let's say I have a sample string and mm, I'm going to have four characters and we can always find the length of the character using something like this, a length by parenthesis. If you remember, this is exactly how we call a function. And if I were to run this code, I'm going to get the value 4. But if you think about it, um, we haven't done anything logical to count the number of characters in a string, right? Because all these functions, they, are, they have already been written by some really good X programmers out there. And for us, the end user of this um, Python code, we can just call out any function that they have written. So this is when library routines come into um, become very useful because you don't want to write codes from scratch anytime because other people might have already written it. So what you can do is just call the function that I've written. And this is why function is so popular nowadays. All right. So um, I, besides the length function, we have tons of other functions here. Um, we have the mod function used to find a remainder of a division. If you remember, it's the percentage symbol. And diff, short for division, used to divide two numbers. Round, it returns the output of the nearest integer to a floating point number that is passed to it. And also random, which return a randomly selected integer from a given range of integers. So we don't have to write all these codes from scratch to achieve these functionalities because we can, only, we can just call it a function. So these are some codes here. I'm going to show you how um, maybe this does because I've shown how these things work. And let, let us try to run a round function, OK? So I'm going to create value, can value, and followed by a round function. Let me see, um, 32, and round it to two decimal place. I believe this is two decimal place. Oh, I forgot to print it out. And you can see that it's being printed out. Oh, OK, it's not two decimal place. Say, so one decimal place, 6.3. But if I want to have um, zero, just round without any um, freak, I will get six instead. So these are the codes that have already been written by other programmers. And first, we just call the function that they have written. OK, um, besides round, we also have random here. I'm going to write from random, import random. So what I'm doing here is just to import the functions that the other programmers have written, which are stored in the random libraries. So um, let's run value, create a random. We can just call value like that. And you get a random value from this point. So it should be a decimal numbers. As you can see, this is the random number being generated. If I run to, if I were to run it again, I'm going to get other than 0 0.194. You can see, I'm going to get the other um, the value. Feel free to try that out and try out all these library routines to create programs that you like. So um, these are library routines and I'm going to just go through a few tips on how to create a maintainable program. Okay, so for all the application that you are using with Google, Facebook, Instagram, or any apps that you got from app stores, they usually contain millions and if not thousands of lines of codes. So how do we ensure that our codes is tidy and neat, right? So once a program is needed written, um, here is some of the reason why we need to maintain a program because it may need to um, up, be maintained or updated by another programmer at a later date. So the programmers may have no documentation other than a copy of the source code. So what they are saying here is that even if you are the programmers 
writing the code, you might forget what you've written after, let's say, a few months. So you need some ways to help you recall what you have written in the past. So first of all, um, some really useful tips is always use meaningful identifier name for variables, constant, arrays, constituents, and functions. So I have an illustration here. Instead of using AAA as your function name, which doesn't actually mean anything, right? You can write something like that, which even if the people who doesn't write this code, they immediately they understand what is the um, function of this function, okay? So that's um, one thing. Always use identifier to name for your variables, array, or procedures. So another thing is that pro programs should always be divided into modules using procedures or function wherever possible. So try to create functions whenever you can so that you don't um, ended up copy or pasting a lot of code like what we did just now, okay? So the third tips is to be fully commented using your programming language commenting features. So instead of just writing your codes and function like that, you can actually write something out there that describe what this code does. And these are the codes that will not be run by others because you just put a, a symbol here. So if you can see, um, um, we have this code here. So I'm going to say generate a random number, a random number. So it will still run as normal because this line of code will not be run due to this character here. So this is what we call commenting. This line is not a code, but just some description of what the code does here. Okay, so this is how it works. And in fact, a book has been written to teach software engineers how to write clean code which is to make their program more maintainable, and it's around 464 pages. So if you are interested, do check it out if you're interested in becoming a software engineer. So let's proceed to the next part of the lecture, um, which is called an array. Uh, we have learned this in chapter seven, but we'll learn how to create an array instead in Python. So variables, just a recap, are memory location that can store a piece of data. Right. So when we create a variable here, my data equal to ten. Um, what the computer is doing behind the hood is that it's storing ten in the memories, and when we were when we call this my data code, and it automatically refers to whatever stored in the my data variable. So that's a variable, but an array is actually a series of this memory location where all of the data is of the same data type, which means that when we we can store many, many values into just one variable. And if I were to store, um, let me show you in code, how do I create an array? Um, what we have learned so far is just to store a number, let's say it's only five into a variable, and we can refer to it by just printing out number, and you should be able to get the value five, correct? But what if I want to store multiple values into one variable? I can create this array of number, let's name it this way, and by a square bracket, I want to put one, two, three. And the use how the reason this is useful because if I were to print out array of number, instead of one number, these three number will be printed out all together. All right. So an array is a series of this memory location. All right. A, a location can still store one value, but it's just that when we call this, when we refer to an array variable, we just take in the value in groups. Okay, so each location can still store one data, but locations can be grouped together. And one thing about array is that, like string, it also can be accessed by each element can be accessed by its index. All right, and the index usually start from zero. Zero is used for the first character. One is used for the second character, and so forth. And to retrieve an element of an array, we can just do array name followed by square bracket index. So in this um, question, um, example here, what if I only want this element too? Um, I can do this array of number, use the array name, followed by the index. So we know that index starts from zero, so it's gonna be zero, one. So the, the value two has an index of one. If I were to print out this value, you will see that the value two 
will be printed out. All right. So this is, this is how we access an element in the array. Um, this is how you declare an array in pseudocode, just a recap. All right. And this is how you retrieve an element in the array in pseudocode. And in Python, as I've already shown you how to use this, um, when we want to create an array, we don't call it an array in Python. Instead, we call them lists. All right. List is almost equivalent to an array. So this is how we do it. We can create it an array, access its element. We can even change in this code, we can even change its element here. So um, let's say I want to change this element here to 100. What I can do is just this array of numbers. The first element is index zero. I'm gonna assign a value of 100 to it. And when I were to print it, if I were to print it out, the array, the list, so I'm gonna run this, you will see that initially the array value this is the array value the list value but after i change the value here here the first value becomes 100. okay so um this is all about one dimensional array but in python we have we can create something even cool cooler called the two-dimensional array so a two-dimensional array has multiple columns and multiple rows of data all with the, the same data type much like an excel file so don't you feel like this is like a Google Sheet or a Microsoft Access file where we have row and columns? And um, some of the example usage is, let's say you want to create a game, two-dimensional arrays can be used to create a world map, like a simplified world map like that, in which each is store character that represents the different objects in a game. It can also be used to store um, your grades, right? For student A, what is his or her grade in physics, chemistry, and biology? And this is how we declare a two-dimensional array in serial code. Declare with the name, with the array keyword, and how many rows we want, followed by how many columns that we want. And the index start from zero. All right, we can also access elements here. We all we assign a value by just um, using the index. So let's say I, I want to have a value of 10 in row 2, column 1. I can just do this. Square bracket 2, followed by 1, the row number, the column number, assign it to the value of 10. And we can even output um, whatever that is inside a specific location in an array, 0, 0. So 30 will be output. So this is how we create two-dimensional array in Python. So this is what we do just now. We have a list of number. And to create two-dimensional array, two-dimensional list, we can just create a list within a list. So this is how you can do it. You see, we have a list here. But within this list, we have also another list. And when you write this line of code in Python, this is the visual illustration of how it will look like. All right? It's basically a list inside a list. All right, so I'm going to show you how I can create this. Let's say I want to create a list of lists. All right, two, two, three, three. All right, um, this is how we can run it. To create an array of number and to access a certain number in the value, we can just um, look at what is the index. Let's say I want to create this, retrieve this value from the array. I can first look for look into what is the row number. So the row index here is zero. So the row number here is zero. And followed by what is its index inside its list. So it's gonna be zero one. So I'm gonna write in another zero here. It's like double square bracket. And I'm gonna print out the value. And you should notice that one will be printed out. All right. I will change this to 100 and I want to access this element. It's going to be row number 0, but column number 1, the index inside this list. Run it, you're going to get 100. So this is how um, two-dimensional array work. And since we have already learned lists, I figured that it's always also important for you to learn how to iterate through a list. All right. Let's say you have a list and you want to print out the value one by one in your list. All you can do is just, instead of what we did just now, for counter in range, um, let's say 10, instead of doing this, if I want to access um, the array, 
let, let me create an array that has value a, b, and c. If I want to go through this array one by one, first by this, go through this again, I can just write per item in array, which is this, print out the item. So this item, for each iteration, it will switch from this item to this item and this item. So if I run this code, you'll see that A, B, C will be printed out. Okay, yeah, this is from here. So um, this is how to loop through a list, all right? So I'm going to show you how to loop through a list of lists in Python, all right? So this is, this is some code. Let's say I have a list of lists that in the list itself, it has two lists that contains these values. So I'm going to go through this for small list and big list. And go, it will first go through this list. And this is a nested iteration. And followed by for character in small list, go through the elements in the list. I'm going to print out character A. And we'll go back to the second line of code here. And we'll go through the next element by B. And the inner loop will have ended. And return to the outer loop for small list and big list is like if it is assessing another loop. And for character in this small list, I'm going to print out C and D. So this is how um, to loop through a list of lists in Python. So let's do some programming to just consolidate your learning because it's sometimes very difficult to understand the topic if you don't solve some problems. So let's do the exam mark question. All right. All right. So let me change this the name of this to um, maybe because I have a typo here. Um, Zach. All right. So what we're going to do here is to, this is our task, to turn every item in the following list into squares. You can print out your results, all right? So um, what I'm saying here is that this is our codes. We have a list of number from one to two, one to seven. So we need to turn the value here, each and every one of them to a square. So which means our result should be one, four, nine, sixteen, twenty-five, thirty-six, and forty-nine. We should print this out. So what we can do, um, how I'm going to solve this problem is, I will first create an output array that has um, the initial value of zero. I'm going to replace them with the square, and to to convert this array to this array, all I need to do is to go through the items in here, and square it up and place the result back to the output array. So to do this, I'm going to do for item in numbers. All right. So for number, all right, for, for each number in number, I can name it this way. I'm going to output. All right, I think um, another better way to do it is to use a counter in range. How many times do I want to run? I want to run the number of the length of num the length of the list. OK, I'm going to run. So this will automatically um, run for seven times because the length of numbers here is seven. So for e each iteration, I'm going to take whatever that is inside my numbers array. So counter will keep increasing. And from the first element back to the last element, I'm going to power it by two and store it inside my array, my output array. OK, so that's it. Because it's an iteration, it will just go through every time. So if I were to print out my output counter, um, a console, let me run this code, Python, that. All right. So I have an arrow here. All right, I have omitted an parenthesis. And you will see that the result have been printed out. All right, the output have been squared. So this is just one example. And I have another task here, which I will not be talking about in this video because it's quite a difficult and hard one. So feel free to write down your codes in the command section of this video, and I will let you know whether it's correct or not. Okay, so this is a question on how you can apply two dimensional array skill into practice. So here is everything here. So we have two questions. Feel free to solve it, and I will show you how to. I'll try to see whether I can help you in the comment section. So to finish this chapter, I'm just going to end it with how do we read 
a file into Python, let's say a txt file, and to Python. So we have seen programming involve the input of a lot of data. So we key in the age and then the programs do whatever that is required. But um, another types of input can also be in the form of file. So instead of typing in our input, we can let the input be a PowerPoint, not PowerPoint, an Excel file or even a simple TXT file. And files can be read or written too. So let's say I want to read, say I have a file called name TXT and that contain a student name called student A. And I want to read these values into my file. And one way I can do this is to write like this. So I'm going to go back to my main.py, delete everything that we don't need. And this is the code to redo it. So if you can see it, I have names.txt, I have student A, B, and C. And if I want to read this code into Python and print it out, all I need to do is just write the open function, open the file name, and R here is best, um, means reading mode, and store call the function read line, what it will do is that it will read one line in this main, the names.txt input file, and then store the value into our name variable. So let me try to run it for you. If I were to run this code, you'll see that student A will be printed out. And to make sure that um, you understand, let me write down my name, student James Gunn. And if I were to change it to name txt, and I run this main.py again, let me run this, you see that my name will be printed out. So what if you said, I want to print out every line here instead of just one line. Instead of saying read line, you can just write read lines instead. And you were to run this, you'll see that you, all the names here have been input into an array. So you can just retrieve by just going through the list here. So that's reading file. And Besides reading from a file into Python, we can also write something into a file outside of Python. So let's say here are my, um, I have a bunch of colors that I want to write it into a file called name txt. So here are the codes that I write here. First of all, we create a file. If it does not exist, if it does exist, it will write into the file. We write what W here, stand for write mode. And just for color in colors, for each item in the array, we write this color into the file. So I'm going to show you how this works. And I've written the code here. Um, create a list containing all the colors. And I'm going to open a file. As you can see, the colors.txt is not here. So what this code does is that it will create a colors.txt file. Be very observant. And for color in colors, it will just go through each element and write down the elements into a file. So um, let me run this to explain better. When I run this code, you can see that colors.txt has been created. And you see, this is the file, this is the value that we have written. And now would you change it to um, pink, black instead, and the Python will run this pink black into this color.txt. Boom, everything has been written. So this is how Py we can write read and write files to Python. Feel free to try to do some cool stuff with your own. I'm just providing the fundamentals. And if you have any question, just post it in the comment section. So this is how it works. So that's the end of um, today's topic, programming. I hope you learned a lot. So feel free to just write down any questions or any new types of videos that you want me to make so that I can help you further in your programming journey. So that's the end of this video. Thank you for watching. See you.